Welcome to Pitch It To Me Podcast, a show about the subjective past, present, and potential future of flesh and blood design. It's time to grab your Mountain Dew and parents' credit cards, gamers. There's half-naked, muscly dudes in high heels in the arena. In today's episode, we'll be discussing the heavy hitter set announcement, and we'll all make some Grand Slam predictions about what's to come. On Red Pitch, Clark wants to discuss the heroes in the set. On Yellow Pitch, Joel wants to talk about the three classes. And on Blue Pitch, Fuzzy is excited about the limited format. You can find us across all socials, such as TikTok and Instagram, at Pitchatimmy Podcast. I'm Fuzzy. I'm Clark. And I'm Joel. So... Thank you guys for coming back to the podcast. I know we missed a week. That is my fault. <laughs> well, I got. I wouldn't say your fault, Clark. He couldn't stop licking those doorknobs, man. <laughs> I got sick with COVID, and it's like, okay, that's fine. Like we have some episodes like already recorded. We can keep working on them. And then my computer broke too, <laughs> so I couldn't do any of the editing. And it, this was like right around the time that I was supposed to start editing one of the episodes. And then Thanksgiving was coming up, and it just it didn't work out, and it was just easiest for us to skip a week. Yeah, hopefully you guys aren't too uh, mad at us for it. Um, in other life news, um, I got a car recently. Let's go. Um, I had a really, like, a beater, like a 97 <laughs> Toyota Corolla that was, like, it had, like, a cracked windshield that I was too lazy to replace. <laughs> the driver's side door did not open, so I had to crawl in through the passenger side every time I wanted to drive it. And I've been driving that car for, like... A couple years now. Yeah. With, like, the driver's side door messed up for, like, at least, like, the last year. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's an older car, so it doesn't, like, tell you if you're about to lock your keys in your car, which is something that I would do, like, <laughs> often enough that I had a rule with John that I am never allowed to have both of my keys. <laughs> Luckily, I have a spare, so John can come rescue me sometimes. <laughs> I just replaced the battery on it, and like as far as I know, like the engine works like great. So I'm probably gonna end up like selling it for parts soon. So if any of you listeners want to buy my '97 <laughs> Toyota Corolla, perhaps trade it for flesh and blood cards. I am open to negotiations. Fuzzy, you have wanted to trade that car for flesh and blood cards for a couple of for about a year now. There is lots of cardboard out there that is more valuable than that. Car. <laughs> And it still drives. You could drive this car. Joel, I know you're looking for a new car. Yeah, so in adjacent news, I lost... This is a record for me. So I lost both my job and my car in the same day, within an hour of each Jesus. other, actually. I can give you a good deal on my Corolla. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone has a car that they would willing to trade flesh and blood for, yeah, I got you. <laughs> I got you. So, so if someone wants a car and they're willing to give up flesh and blood cards, contact Fuzzy. Mm. And if somebody wants to get rid of a car and they're willing to accept flesh and blood cards, (laughs) reach out to Joel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're inverses. We we got it all here at Pitch It To Me Podcast. (laughs) (laughs) And you can email us at Pitch It To Me Podcast. Just make sure that you say whether you want Fuzzy's car or Joel's cardboard. Yep. (laughs) Car for cards or cards for cards? (laughs) (laughs) Joel, you haven't it hasn't been all bad for you, right? No, I um so I haven't played Flesh and Blood since well, a long time really, since like the PQ season. But I played in two skirmishes and I top four the first one and top eighted the second one. Yo. Um, and these are so cal skirmishes, please. These, so this is basically nationals. Yeah, two they're, nationals they're of full killers. Mm-hmm. So the the first one was uh, won by Andrew Goodwin and the second one was won by Andrew. Rudin. No way. Yep. <laughs> wow. Two of the best Andrews I know. And I know, I think, three of them. They're all really good. But, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it was a lot of fun. I played both against Sai. Um, and then she, you know, ll so Yeah, I only did one skirmish this season so far. Technically, mm-hmm. the, there's one happening this weekend right now, so mm-hmm. I could do one, like, tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But I played Kano just, like, to have some fun, to cast some spells. And I did have fun. I didn't <laughs> win any rounds. But I kind of knew how this was going to happen because I haven't played Kano in, like, so long. Yeah. Of course, like the night after the skirmish, I was playing with Han and I was like dominating him in like one of like the worst <laughs> matchups. So like it all like clicked for me like once the skirmish was over. And it was because Andrew Rudin had just made top eight. Yeah. And he was going, Yo, this deck is cracked. Here's what you do. And I'm like, What? And my mind was expanding and then Kano rotated. So Yeah. <laughs> no. His rotations have been healthy though. Apparently, like a bunch of people 
started the skirmish season, didn't really like where their hero was, but mm. now with all these LLs, like they're coming back towards the end of the season. So, mm-hmm. it, yeah, the fact that yeah. Chain, like one of the worst offenders in the skirmish format, LL'd uh, in the first weekend, opened up a lot of decks, and unfortunately, um, one of the coolest decks and one of the lamest decks both LL at this uh, on the following weekend. So I know Kano was really cool. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Everybody <laughs> hates Kano, and now I have to convince people to sit down to like kitchen table magic games if I want to play this young Kano deck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's enough for our turn zero. Let's go ahead and move into our red pitch. Let's. What do you have for us, Clark? I want us to talk about the heroes. So. In classic Pitch It To Me podcast, we get absolutely shafted by Legendary Studios, who've already announced a bunch of the cards and mechanics in the set. Oh, no, we're not shafted. <laughs> we're pretty shafted. I disagree with this point that Clark <laughs> is so generously bringing up. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, there is still enough for us to talk about. Um, we know that this set is going to have six heroes in it, two for each of the three classes. We're seeing Guardian. <coughs> Brute and Warrior make a return. They're going to have hybrid cards. It's going to be really interesting. And we saw our first new hero, Kasai. Let's go. Yeah, right as she <laughs> LLs from Blitz, Just we're getting her again. Whew. Yeah. And she looks really cool, too. Like, mm-hmm. her hero ability makes, like, gold tokens, where her old hero ability gave her copper tokens. So she's moving up in the world. She's quite the entrepreneur. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's some really great storytelling from Legend Story Studios mm-hmm. where we went from this Kasai that was young only, only copper, really at the start of her story, to this Kasai that's now in the middle of her story. She's building an army. She is moving forward. It, I can almost now imagine a third Kasai card in the future where she's going to have her army and like be a general and trying to do the things that she wants to do. That literally gave me goosebumps. Like you can kind of see it on my arm right now. Yeah. So it, it's really cool that Legend Story Studios is taking this different approach <clears throat> to storytelling through their card game by like reprinting heroes as a living legend mm-hmm. and and showing the progression of the hero that way and the character that way. And I want to yeah. highlight that I fucking knew this was going to happen. For two years, I played Kasai, my, one of my favorite heroes in Blitz, probably my favorite hero in Blitz. And I was like, man, if give me this in adult form and I'm not playing anything else. And everyone's like, Joel, it's young only. She has a title. She's <laughs> never getting adult form. Boom. Mic fucking drop. Not with this mic because it's expensive. But... <laughs> Well, I feel like people kind of assumed like that you meant the same hero ability. A lot of people thought it was going to be the exact same text on the card, just reprinted for adult. And I I did not think they were going to do that. I wish it was, but I'm I'm kind of happy with like the direction that they're going into it. Mm -hmm. I I really agree. I think that version of Kasai was just way too efficient Mm -hmm. in terms of blocking and returning damage. For sure. And so this is a lot healthier look at Kasai. Mm -hmm. Um. I kind of want to lead this into the conversation of we know we're getting 15 new heroes mm. next year, 2024, when Heavy Hitters comes out. Mm. Is this Kasai one of them? Is this a new hero? We've already seen Kasai. Well, they were talking about that in the context of a living legend like system. Mm-hmm. And this is a new hero for the living legend as its own entry. You know, it <clears throat> starts at zero points. So I'm pretty sure, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I would imagine she's she's part of the new like uh, heroes. She's like one of the like this is such a crazy drop from LSS two because it breaks the old format of like you know uh, heroes with the title not getting an adult form mm-hmm. and this being one of like the most revered like Blitz heroes that people have been begging for for a long time. Even I think at like the Pro Quest like address from James White himself, mm-hmm. um, he mentioned it as well. Um, so I, I think it's just awesome. Okay. So if Kasai is one of our new heroes, we have six heroes in the set. Mm-hmm. First prediction time, how many new heroes are we going to get? How many heroes are they going to reprint? How many of these six heroes are going to be brand new card texts? S- yeah, so I'll start off because I have a time-stamped prediction of my own. Mm-hmm. Um, that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This was before Kasai came out, by the way. Yeah. Uh, that they were going to bring back KO... Uh, Valda and Kasai in uh, like either their adult forms with the same ability or a different ability. I think a different ability would be better specifically for Valda and 
uh, KO's case because they didn't really synergize with the rest so of this. This is a cool thing. Mm-hmm. I like this prediction because all three of them were young only heroes mm-hmm. that you are saying they're now going to get a brand new printing mm-hmm. of young and old. Yeah. That's what I would like to see. I think it'd be really cool because Valda has a sick, like specific, you know, uh, chess piece that she cares about. And KO has, you know, two specializations, but it has like kind of a meme ability, right? Mm-hmm. An ability that really stops people from taking his deck very seriously. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you're be- thinking, so out of our six, you think three are going to be brand new? Do you think they're going to reprint three other heroes? Yeah. So I think, I mean, Warrior's kind of tough. I don't know who would be the second Warrior. Um, if it's reprinting, it has to be Dorinthia, right? Right. But mm-hmm. she doesn't really care about. Uh, like she cares specifically about one sword, right. and Kasai cares about two. So would they fit two different card I guess types in there? They could maybe print the other Drinthia from Classic Battles. That's, Quicksilver. Prodigy. If it's a reprint, it has to be one of those two. You know. Well, but Quicksilver cares about the the second Dawnblade, the Resplendent specifically. That's true. You'd have to have Dawnblade the Resplendent in the set. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that would actually be kind of cool too to see like that specific printing of Drinthia. Maybe, I don't know, but I think they might include like maybe Reinar because that's like an easy brute to slot in. So, same text? Same text, probably. Same or, text. or maybe like okay. a Blitz only version. Mm-hmm. I think it's more likely that we'll have six new heroes for this set. Six fully brand new heroes. Yeah. So, that I'm does. Gonna, I'm going to put that in writing. I, yeah. For okay. the viewers, I am taking notes on our predictions because we also have a tradition here on the show where when the set actually comes out, we like to. Go back to these predictions and see how we did. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I think it's going to be six new heroes in the set. Mm-hmm. I agree. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if they're actually going to give Valda brand new text. Because I think okay. Valda's text mm-hmm. works really, really well with gold tokens. That's true. Mm-hmm. So I don't think... You think it might be five new heroes? I think it might only be five, and they're simply going to reprint Valda. There's also, I do like Fuzzy's suggestion of there's going to be three... Blitz only, and then three young and old. Mm -hmm. So only three new CC heroes are being added, but three new Blitz heroes are being added. Yeah, so six total. And I I really hope that they don't. I find Blitz Blitz only heroes to be a little... Lazy, like I wish they would add. Those could also be the reprintings. Like we could see just young Reinar get reprinted. Oh, for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But Valda's ability works really well with opponents drawing cards. Yeah, especially with gold tokens being so prevalent uh in this set. I think that it's actually really nice. Sure, pop your gold token. I get a seismic surge off of it. Not only that, but against uh, Dromai with her new tome, you get like what three surges off off of that. That's kind of insane too. Yeah, Valda's Valda might Valda might be looking good. Yeah, I, forty-two I, health and CC. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we are talking about new fatigue heroes kind of needing to be around. Mm-hmm. Having that extra starting health could be a big part of it for sure. Yeah. With that being said, Valda really liking opponents cracking gold tokens. Mm-hmm. How many heroes do we think are going to play around gold tokens? We do see gold tokens. Existing primarily in generic cards right now. Mm-hmm. Starting Stake and Money Where Your Mouth Is are the two cards that we see generate gold tokens regularly. Mm-hmm. Both of them are generic. They're not tied to any one specific class, but then we also see Kasai's hero ability and specialization card both requiring and creating gold tokens. Mm-hmm. So Kasai is built around gold tokens. So with my point on Valda being that she likes seeing a opposing heroes crack gold tokens and draw cards. I wanted to spread the question to you guys. How many other heroes are going to build around gold tokens? Because so far we've only seen gold generation in generic cards with starting stake and money where your mouth is. But Kasai and her specialization also play around gold tokens. Mm. Do we think other heroes are going to be built around gold tokens in the same way? I think that's a really good question. Although I think it's a very vague one. So hear me out. Like You wouldn't say that Briar uses gold tokens, right? But I had a really good time playing Crown of Dominion and Briar because drawing one card for two resources is just a really good rate that almost anyone can use, you know? Or slamming cash in to draw two. Like It doesn't really need any other support for a gold token to be something that you can easily use and play with. So when in a draft, you might be thinking, okay, my hero doesn't have 
used gold tokens literally on the text box in the way that Kasai almost does, but anyone can use them because if I have an extra blue in hand, now I don't, and I have an extra resource, you know? Like, it fixes a lot of problems that you could have in a draft, so having a gold token isn't something you have to play around in order for it to be really good. So in draft, I can imagine, like, let's say I had Reinar as an example. Mm -hmm. Like, Reinar's text box has nothing to do with gold tokens. His kit is not, like, designed to give you gold tokens, except he definitely could oh, use them, you know? Yeah, using a blue that doesn't have six power to cycle that into maybe a red or yellow that would have six power. And an mm -hmm. extra resource. Yeah, sure, you're technically floating a resource while doing that, but you're replacing, you're turning your blue pitch into a red pitch and replacing it with a random card off the top. Right, right. So that's a kick ass ability that you have access to when, with the gold tokens. So, like in a draft, you could easily be incentivized. We don't know a whole lot about the set, so I'm not going to tell you it's what strategy, right? But like you could easily say, oh yeah, I'll grab this thing that makes gold tokens even though I'm playing Reinar, because it's good, right? Gold tokens are just good value. They don't need synergy to be good. Compare that to something like aim counters in Ranger. Mm -hmm. You kind of do need to have synergy. You need to have like a good reason for your hero to run aim counters. Mm -hmm. You can't just do it with whatever Ranger necessarily. So not all the heroes are going to be built around gold, but is Kasai going to be the only one then, Fuzzy? Or are we going to see others? Yes, so I actually think um, there might be a Guardian that plays with it a little bit more than, like, even if Kasai was the only, like, true gold generator, I think there might be, like, one or two others, like, specifically in the Guardian uh, archetype, because Double Down, which is a two-cost uh, action, says you may destroy a gold you control rather than pay its uh, resource cost. So I'm thinking... You know, obviously Kasai can use it pretty easily because you can generate gold throughout the mm -hmm. game. But a guardian, like unless you, I don't know, play like uh, first stake, I think it's called uh, starting stake. Starting stake, excuse me. There's not really a whole lot of other ways to reasonably get this cost to be zero. So maybe there is a guardian that like plays with it a little bit. I'm not sure, but um, that would be my guess. Like there might be like like a second line of text, mm -hmm. kind of like uh, you know how the outsiders heroes. Or uh, Riptide, I'm thinking of specifically where they have two lines of text that kind mm -hmm. of hinted two different play styles. Uh, Riptide specifically being like traps and uh, loading mm -hmm. uh, after you play a card from hand. So maybe the new Guardian like has something to do with like I don't know dominate or extra power, something Guardian esque. Mm -hmm. And then the second part being like gold or yeah. just more gold in that kit in general. So I will say if I'm thinking about sort of like what gold allows you to do. And the fact that we've seen gold here, it's generic. There's a lot of draw synergy actually in all three of these archetypes. Like we have seen Guardian with natural draw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have seen Warrior now is Kasai having this gold support. And Brute has draw. It's discard then draw. It's looting, right? Mm -hmm. But it's still draw mechanics. There's also a lot of draw discard cards in Brute. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know. I, again, I'm thinking limited wise. Valda's really happy because Valda's looking for her opponents to draw cards. Mm -hmm. Whether that's through gold, whether that's through the draw discard or discard draw mechanics of brew, mm -hmm. like all of it, very very happy about extra resource out of that blue by drawing another one. Very very happy about that. Mm -hmm. It could fix a lot of issues. Almost being a seismic surge in and of itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I actually don't think any heroes are going to have any more gold token synergy because oh. gold tokens are just going to be good and instead we're going to look at other ways of drawing cards yeah i think that makes sense clark like again gold tokens are just so good you don't need to build around them to use them and have them support your strategy you could also maybe see like remember like when uh, Legend Story Studios released Round the Table and there was this bard hero that had a payoff for having lots of cards in the pitch zone, like I could see something like that coming up in the draft too, where like Whoa. you crack a bunch of gold tokens, like somehow you get like three or four of them, pitch like two cards to draw three, and now you have like an insane hand, and then like it's all downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> for the opponent, yeah. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I want to round out my section by just making a couple of predictions that I have. Last time we did Pitch and Predictions, I won by just sheer number. 
I made more predictions than you guys, so I won more. Yeah, you almost cheated a little bit. I almost cheated <laughs> you, a little you bit. You stuffed the ballot box. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do it again this time. <laughs> Make you guys pump your numbers up a little bit. Okay. I think they are going to reprint Pummel. Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> Pummel and draft. Pummel, Pummel's back. Back in stock. All right. Pitch one blue to like draw a card off a gold token. That one extra mm-hmm. resource makes it so much easier to use Pummel too. I think they're also going to reprint Earthlore Bounty in the expansion slot. The majestic one? Yep, that is the Wait, wasn't it Valda rare? chess piece. It's oh, Earthlore Bounty. Yes, whenever you draw a card from the effect of an action card, create a seismic surge token for each card drawn. Why in the expansion way. slot? Uh, because I don't think it is of the power level that they're willing to put into limited formats. I but like I think they are willing to reprint it with all this new draw card synergy that we're going to see. I disagree. I think they would... Uh, it's not... Because if you look back at uh, Bright Lights, they, they chose to put Tekla Foundry Heart in the uh, expansion slot because mm-hmm. that is truly too powerful. Yeah, it's a legendary. In an all-mech set. But a Majestic, I think, is okay. I think they might... Keep and they the printed all the freaking like red evos that like you put a couple hyper drivers in there and you get like crazy value from yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Those were legal. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. Still prediction, still prediction. Let's see if I'm right <laughs> or wrong. And I think they're also going to really build different equipments for each hero. So I think Guardian is going to have like a hammer build and like maybe an axe build or something like that. That axe is also going to be for warrior, and then warrior is also going to have like sword or spear. And then the axe, or uh, maybe the hammer, is also for brute, but then brute's also going to have like a club build, right? So there's going to be this like weapons are going to be the hybrids that can be shared between two classes, and then there's going to be a class specific weapon. Mm -hmm. So for every single hero, you're going to have the option of multiple weapon builds. That'd be so cool because I feel like those three classes are the least, like they have options, but they don't, you know? Like Brutes, yeah. if you're using anything other than a Manable Claws, you're throwing. For Guardian, you're either using Titan's Fist or Anothos. Sledge and very, very, very specific metas. And then Warrior, you have Centauri Sabers or Dawnblade. And there's a third one we don't talk about, right? Yes. Um. And now with the axe, it's a little bit different, but I think this is the set that's going to... I I really hope you're... I preaching. really think they're going to break it open, and yeah. there's going to be a lot of creativity in which weapon you decide to run yeah. and how that ends up building your hero. That's going to be so fucking cool. Those are my predictions, <laughs> and I think with that, red section, red pitch is over. Thank you, Clark. I think it's time for us to move on to yellow pitch. Joel, what do you have for us regarding class identities? So... I was really excited when Heavy... Well, I was and I wasn't, right? Like, when Heavy Hitters was first announced, Lexi was still around, Icelander was still around. I'm like, okay, that's cool. It's obviously going to be Warrior, Guardian, and Brew because it's Heavy Hitters, but Mm -hmm. what does it matter if these heroes are still around gatekeeping them? And then they both left in, like, a month. So now I'm, like, super hyped because... Well, well, it depends, right? I'm still very doomer about Brute as a class in general. I think they're going to fuck it up yet again. <laughs> um, so uh, my like open-ended question is like, man, is Brute going to get like a new mechanic that would actually like save the class? Because like, so far, the only archetypes that really uh, exist is um, Blood Rush Bellow. Mm-hmm. That's it. You base your deck around like having a good enough six... Um, like a, a, a deep enough pool of sixes, a deep enough pool of blues to play your sixes. And you just kind of play around that because you have to be aggressive in this meta. It's like mm-hmm. r- pretty fast for mid range to survive mm-hmm. as a brute player. It is a very good card that enables some really big turns. Mm-hmm. It also really plays into the issue of brute has been Reinar. Yeah. And j- that's kind of all brute has had is Reinar's play style of discarding and getting the value off of that with Intimidate. Mm. And it's why we didn't really see discard in Leviah too much. Like there's a little bit of it mm. in trying to give her more go again. They run a lot of those draw discard cards. Right. But like it that's really just been the brute identity is Reinar yeah. and discard. Yeah, like Leviah takes the same cards that Reinar plays, like maybe like you know, um six or nine of them. And uses them on, on a really different level and silos their design like really hard so that there's not really anything connecting the two. And I think if there's a bit more flexibility in Brute's design space, 
that we could see these heroes be played like in a more interesting way. Like Levia just uses like all blood die cards and like you know twelve Reinar cards, and Reinar is just Reinar. What kind of incentives do you think a brute class would need in order to play something other than Blood Rush Bellow? Your, well, your question was to stay away from Blood Rush Bellow, right? Like, like it'd have to be something good, right? It'd have to be like a good reason not to. It'd have to be better than Blood Rush Bellow. Yeah, and I I can't even like conceive that because Intimidate is already extremely broken. Like that's why they haven't really like touched it since Reinar came out. Mm-hmm. Uh, other than like you know uh, Scowling Flesh Bag. But, like, because Blood Rush Bellow allows you to go from a mid range deck where you block two, you know, play two cards and, like, leak, you know, six damage. Because, like, the normal blocking power of uh, a hero, if they block everything, is like 12 usually. So, if you're leaking eight, if you're presenting 18 off of a Blood Rush Bellow, you're usually leaking six. So, you have to find a way to not only break parity with, like, the normal turn cycle trades, but not be broken enough where you just, like, don't really destroy the game with like scapskin leathers getting multiple action points and having some type of evasion that makes it worth not running blood rush below that also um implies a new weapon that is strong enough on its own like as a turn ender or a turn starter that doesn't have go again because mm-hmm. um, then there's like no reason for you not to play blood rush bellows and manimal claws so to summarize all of the word vomit that i just kind of like spewed for you guys to listen uh essentially i think brute has been so centric around Blood Rush Bellows that in order for LSS to great, create a new like core mechanic for Brute, it has to kind of steer away from Blood Rush Bellow or be like adjacent to Blood Rush Bellow in some way. So I think some form of evasion, like whether it be like more overpower. Mm. Um, oh, know, giving overpower to Brute? Right, because like there's there's some instances in Levia's like um, most recent card pool of, mm-hmm. a, of a wall breaker. Like if you banish something... Uh, that six or more you get o- that specifically gets overpower. So a way, basically, I think they should, or I'm hoping that they create a new core mechanic that lets brutes be a bit more evasive in a way that they can not only uh, still have their good matchups into mid range and other control decks, but also still have the aggressive capabilities to keep up with the aggro decks. Otherwise, you're still have the same exact core philosophies with Levia and and Reinar as a whole. I'm very interested to see how LSS does it. Yeah, and I think they do need to. I think we do see agility being something that they are giving to Brute as a way of presenting Go again with yeah. agility tokens. Mm-hmm. I think Clash seems to also be the new mechanic that they're centering Brutes around. Yeah, yeah. And so attacks that Clash, and then like maybe on success Intimidate. Mm. Well, we've seen Clash on generics already. So, like Clash and Wager, we've seen both generic versions of those things. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's just going to kind of be a running theme throughout the set. But it's something that very much matches the identity of Brute Warrior Guardian relatively yeah. well. Brute seem they seem to want Brute to stay in this realm of the more or RNG focused thing, yeah. but where you can still construct your deck in such a way that you can make it more certain. Mm. So Blood Rush Bellows was great for this because it had that really nice three card hand mm. of pitch a card, play, you're discarding the six. You're guaranteed to discard the six. You cannot not discard the six. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think in a similar way, they're Clash feels like that. You can build your deck in such a way that you are always going to win that clash. Right. Especially against like the aggro decks, right? Like mm-hmm. against Guardian, it gets a little bit dicier. So you have to run things with really high base power, like Swing Big. Well, you're already running Swing Big, but like um, Shade and Death Hydra. Yeah. Right, for instance. So but, I think that that I think Clash is going to be something that they're going to build a lot of brood around. I could I could really see that happening. Um, like because the thing is too, like with Blood Rush Bellows, it specifically says Brute Attacks. So you, mm-hmm. there's only so many non-Brute Attacks you can um, include in your deck. Yes. Like CNC is like a must, but that still sucks when you draw on a Blood Rush Bellows mm-hmm. turn. Um, so in order to use... And I really like this idea of like being able to use Clash to get more advantage, but without like presenting on-hit damage, right? Um, so this might be like include more clash cards with brute specific at, at the bottom of, of the card to make it a little bit more um, usable, I guess. Clash is also interesting because you get to see the top card of your deck and it stays on top, right? Mm. I think it's... So all of our draw discard yeah. cards 
our Blood Rush spell is discarding and then drawing. Now we know what we're going to be drawing, and mm -hmm. it gives a little bit more certainty to those cards. That Because you have talked a lot about how you don't like to draw discard cards because mm -hmm. you don't know what you're going to draw and then discard. Yeah. And it could totally screw over your turn. Now with Clash, we can know. That's actually really cool. <laughs> I yeah. Agility as a conditional go again that we're going to have to manage with our attacks. Right. I, I think it opens up a realm for Brute to still have some RNG mechanics, but still be very limited in um, in their certainty. So we already talked about Brute, um, so I'm not going to harp on it as much in this next section, but I did want to kind of highlight the difference between like class identity and the heroes and how like heavy hitters can change that. Um uh, Brute we've already talked about, but specifically for warriors, like warrior has always been uh, Dorinthia with like Dawnblade, or if the meta is really bad, then you play Axes because it's very efficient turns. And then Bolton, I mean, hasn't been playable until now. So now it's kind of like up in the air as to like how he fits in the rest of the metascape. Because mm -hmm. um, he's just like had like literally like no play outside of like, you know, uh, the pure Raiden list. And that still doesn't uh, count for any of the other warriors in existence currently. Mm -hmm. So with the prediction you already made, Clark, about the you know the hybrid weapons and class specific weapons, and Kasai adding like more one handed, uh, one handed weapon synergies, I think we're gonna see a, a big influx of cards to support that playstyle, which would make uh, Dorinthia better. I don't know if Bolton will still use it. I think his cards kind of still point to the charge and like the uh, rating game plan, but it'll be interesting to see like if they only do the two-handed swords so that it gives Dorinthia and Kasai more more mm -hmm. lead or more meta share or if they also incorporate like axe with the second warrior um so that they can even do like Bolton with his hatchets Dorinthia with the hatchets or yeah. like either one of them with a decimated great axe I I completely agree I think they need to break open warrior and guardian mm -hmm. both in the way that we really felt like bright lights did yeah I Bright Lights really opened up Mechanologist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I want this set to do the same for these classes. I want this Brute to feel new. Right. I don't want it to be super discard-focused and like hyper mid rangey. Like I want it to feel different, and I want Guardian to feel a little new. Guardian has felt very one-note with Bravo, mm -hmm. and just run a lot of blues and crush effects, and that's all Guardian has really felt like. Let's see something new come into play. Let's see some new ideas. I think um, new weapons is going to be a really easy way, especially for Warrior of helping it feel different. For sure. Uh, a spear that costs two, maybe even a sword that costs two, right? Anything that just presents different play patterns than mm -hmm. what we've really seen from these, from these classes is what I'd like to see. I think they're going to do it with weapons, especially for Warrior, mm -hmm. but... I, I don't know what Guardian's going to look like and how they're going to open Guardian up. Because Guardian feels like a really nicely designed class. I'm definitely excited <clears throat> to see what kind of weapons they come up with, especially in the Gladiator arena, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it can't be a Gladiator heavy hitters arena without, like, a whole, like, battlement of weapons, like a whole rack of them, and you're <laughs> going through the rack and you're like, hmm, do I want the Great Axe, the uh, Great Club, maybe a crossbow could be my style. Ooh. Ooh. Or... Fuzzy, do you want to do you want to make that prediction? Do you want to make it official? Um, um, let me do it a little bit differently. Um, I think every hero is my prediction. Mm. Every hero will have at least two weapon options in limited. Okay, I like it, Joel. You and I are very warrior and brute oriented as players. So we didn't really talk about Guardian a lot. Fuzzy, do you have any thoughts on what they're going to do with Guardian this set? Um, Guardian has had a lot of potential design space so far. Like, you think of, like, the auras with Guardian that have mm. passive buff effects or that you can crack to get extra attack on your next turn or all the different crush effects that cripple your opponent in different ways where crush is really just, like, a more balanced on hit, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's less binary. Yeah. <laughs> where, like, you have to deal X amount of damage. Um, so to answer your question, Clark... Let me, let me take just a second to come up with a good answer. <laughs> the class feels so good. The class feels so healthy and proper. Maybe the prediction is that they don't change. 
guardian. Mm-hmm. Well, we know yeah. we're having more of an emphasis on like wager generally mm-hmm. in the set, right? Ooh. Where like there are these on hits that are kind of like poking around the corner. And like Guardian has the double down. It's a hybrid card, but it's Guardian where like mm-hmm. you're sacrificing a, a card in order to like just focus on those on hits. Mm-hmm. So Dom, I imagine in this set at least, Guardian's going to have the closest access to like dominate or overpower. Mm-hmm. You know, they're probably going to be the best at getting those so on hits. So that they can in. guarantee the wager. Yeah. Mm-hmm. More oh. so than like Warrior or Brute. Like they'll have other tricks maybe. I'm going to write that down. Yeah. So just like how I said Brute is going to be oriented around Clash, Fuzzy, you're saying Guardian is going to be oriented around Wager. Yes. I'm saying Guardian is going to have the easiest access to dominate or overpower. Yeah, but that's not. And, that's obvious. But I think everyone's going to be focused on wager, you know? Like there's a there's a nice generic common that gives wager to everybody. Maybe Guardian will have like the most of them, I guess. Yeah. That's kind of what I was saying about Brute and Clash. Like Brute is going to be oriented around the Clash mechanic, you're saying Guardian's going to be oriented around the wager mechanic. Sure. And it's going to work because they have access to dominate as a part of their class identity. Sure. <laughs> Do you want to say that? Yeah, I think so. Like, and I'm really imagining this set being like really flexible. And maybe it's just because of what we've seen before so far that, and I don't have an imagination. <laughs> but it feels like everything's gonna be really flexible. Where like a lot of the good cards are generics or hybrids, and classes can do a lot of different things. And there's a lot less focus on drafting your seat and more focus on like drafting like strong generic cards. So is your prediction? This set isn't going to expand a lot of class identity. I am trying to get a prediction out of you. (laughs) I know. I want to put predictions down. But, like, dominate is not a prediction. (laughs) Guardian having dominate is not a prediction. (laughs) I like the two weapons. Like, all heroes are going to have two weapons. I think that's a good prediction. I think Guardian will have more of a focus on wager compared to the other classes. Awesome. Cool. (laughs) Let's go. We got one. It's in the notes now. (laughs) It's crazy. Cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, because wager is on double down and, you know, we see runner runner, like we see these hybrid cards already. Mm -hmm. We know that they're coming back, but like, in what way are they going to like actually help the, like, is it going to be like more limited focus? Cause we see like in outsiders, like a lot of them don't really see a lot of play outside of like, just, you know, worlds just happened and there was a bleed out in the file list Mm-hmm. And Codex of Frailty obviously goes in every Assassin and Ranger list. Yeah, Codex of Frailty is a pretty <laughs> notable entry there. <laughs> yeah, so there's like what two mm-hmm. two cards now that get used pretty um, pretty religiously. So what do the do you think we'll like see the same like limited focus, or will it be more like support for two of the classes that are on the card itself? Isn't like inertia and frailty trap? Those are hybrid cards that get run Those are competitively. Te- mm, I don't really see assassins running them at all. So there, w- um, they are hybrid. You're right, but I don't see the assassins only time I, s- I mean, Azuri runs like very few, like maybe like two or three. Um, yeah, but, sideboard against like Lexi, like frailty trap is just really good against Lexi. right. Arach- Arachne had a bunch of traps too, specifically for the uh, Lexi yeah, matchup, yeah. but they're not really widely used outside of mm-hmm. the Riptide design space, you know. And I'm going to say that's probably where hybrid cards are going to stay. I think mm. they're going to stay primarily for limited, uh-huh. but you may see one or two of them be specifically pushed yeah. to help classes that are struggling. In that way, I think maybe there's going to be a Brute Warrior hybrid that's going to be pretty pushed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because Brute Warrior are kind of like... They're down there. Could be seen as weaker classes right now, especially yeah. in the meta compared to Guardian. Bravo's like, not bad. Bravo can put up. Gar- Bravo is has been in the conversation for the past couple of metas. Well, I don't really think we've seen Dorinthia or Reinar mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, I mean Reinar's pretty good into uh Dromai specifically and Dorinthia's pretty good into Phi, so that might change in the future. But I think heavy hitters is really going to like give us a lot of really interesting cards that'll like Give us way more meta shot than we've seen, you know, in the past. I'm going to make a prediction. They are going to print a majestic blue six card that is going to be a guardian brute <laughs> hybrid. Okay. 
So they I guess don't that wanna, leads into our next question. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to. They don't want a lot of blue sixes being added. They're so, really going to stay away from it. But I feel like there's going to be one majestic one that's going to be hybrid. Could we backtrack a little bit? What do you mean when you say a blue six? I mean a blue card that has six power. It's super important for Reinar's playstyle to have blue cards that can be good resource pitches, but can still exist as discard fodder, can still exist as an attack to throw with how much synergy he has around sixes. And Reinar, I think, has really been gatekept by not having a lot of blue sixes. Well, at the same time, Levi is kind of strong because she has four more blue sixes. You so, know, here's a little bit more of a crazy out there prediction. Since you you were hard pressing me to like, yeah, <laughs> um, we haven't seen any synergy, like explicit synergy with six power cards in brute yet. So maybe we won't oh, have, have any. No six powered synergy. Nothing that says if you blank a card with six or more power, right? So they are printing cards with six power, but yeah. you're right. We haven't seen anything that cares about the card being. So they've six printed. Power. Runner Runner, which does not say six power anywhere on it. It's, right. just, it's, it's six power. It's strictly a go again enabler and gives itself, or like if it has go again itself. The six power makes it work with older brute cards, mm -hmm. but maybe there's no necessary necessarily like incentive in this set, in the limited format at least, to run like six power cards. I hear you, <laughs> and I'm gonna make my prediction. Yeah, uh, that not only will they incorporate more six power synergy because that's so centric to brute and I, wow. I that's like the least like variable thing about it only one of you can be right but i also think there's going to be no blue sixes no blue wow. sixes be at all because in the uh in an address that james white did at, at the pro quest he specifically said I, I some guy asked a question he's like when are we going to get a blue six he's like it doesn't even matter if it blocks we just need it for a blue six <laughs> And James White was like, yeah, we know that's not, that's not why you're going to use it. it. It doesn't have to be playable. It just has to be discardable, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're going to figure out a way to give us a blue six this set. I think it's going to be a long time, if not ever. Like, I, I just don't think it's going to happen again. Any cards that you think will be reprinted? Um, I don't think there'll be... I think there might be, like, a flock of the Felderwalkers type card where they give you okay. it, an Ooh. agility token where it's like a six power and if you reveal something then uh you get an, agil an agility token because currently specifically I specifically where you have to reveal because you already know like yeah well, i'm okay. thinking in the context of like limited um like a generic card that gives agility tokens yeah but it can be like it's a six power so you can still run it in brute right like just more ways to jump through hoops to give um, like runner runner or your other brute cards go again is what I'm expecting because they kind of hinted at um, them trying to be more strict about how easily they give like multiple action points per turn uh, for classes outside of like ninja being like the class with the most access to free go again mm -hmm. but they really want to uh, like increase the cost so I think like more like hoop like you know test of agility is is one where you like clash and then you get an agility token. Or um, you know something to that effect. So for my second prediction, I think because Kasai already confirmed that she's getting the Centauri Sabers, they've kind of been like floating with no owner in CC for a while until now. I think if they do end up creating uh, Valda and Kale in their adult forms, I think uh, Mandible Claws and Sledge of Anvilheim will both go to those respective owners to kind of account for the rest of the weapons, or they'll get their new. You know, at least Valda will get her own like signature weapon, but K will definitely get Mandible Claws. That way, this you know Blood Rush Bellows centric deck will eventually be phased out and maybe open up more brute design that way. Do you think it'd be like a reprint or like a reimagining? Uh, like, is it literally Mandible Claw or is it like Mandible Claw Two does something slightly different? I think it'll be actually Mandible Claws and Sledge and Sledge. But if they do something different, then. I'd be okay with that too. You know, I like that because like we were saying with the gold token, it's you replace the card and net one resource. That makes Sledge a one card hand with mm -hmm. the gold token. You pitch a blue, pop mm -hmm. the gold, draw a blue, there's your four resources to yep. Sledge. Because previously with Sledge, like you'd use it as an aggro, aggro game plan where you like wait till you have Tunic up. Okay, block with two cards, use Tunic and blue, Arsenal my last card. You know, that's mm -hmm. a... 
it's a pretty big point swing. So something like gold tokens can make a uh, sledge of end prime way easier to use in that way. So I like that too, Clark. Mm-hmm. So with that being said, I think that's kind of all that I had uh, for yellow pitch, but I think it's time to go to uh, Fuzzy's pitch. What do you got for limited, Fuzz? Dang, Joel, thanks for that awesome segue. <laughs> <laughs> that Clark definitely didn't ruin. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really excited to just talk about limited. I love imagining new limited formats. Every time LSS creates a set, it feels like the limited is better than the last, especially at least with the last two. Outsiders, I think, was an amazing draft environment when the introduction of hybrid cards really making things go smoothly. And then Bright Lights is a really smooth draft, if not just because every card is legal. <laughs> it makes it really easy. <laughs> yeah. One big thing that they're changing with this set is they're introducing a new type of draft format that we haven't seen before and that I think was a little bit inevitable just because like Magic has kind of done it in the past and that's a multiplayer draft. Mm. I'm not sure if it's like the main draft format for heavy hitters or if it's just like an option for how you play it, but there's this idea that's an ultimate pit fight draft where after the eight players in a regular draft pod, regular size draft pod, draft their three packs, they have their deck, they separate into two different pods of four, and they play a multiplayer game, four players, where there's only one winner, and after that one round, then the winners from each of those four-man pods come together for a 1v1 finals match, which is a lot faster (laughs) than the drafts that we played in the past where you're playing three rounds of play. So it sounds a little bit crazy to me. I have some thoughts. (laughs) So, first of all, I feel like a multiplayer draft was inevitable for Flesh and Blood. It's kind of just a matter of time. I think it's actually a little bit early in Flesh and Blood's lifespan. I'm kind of surprised that it's coming up. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense that they would flavor it with, like, an all-out gladiator arena. Like, that makes kind of sense to me. If there's going to be a multiplayer, like, they've already kind of... Ultimate Pit Fight sounds like a gladiator arena already, you know? uh And they're just kind of like, let's make a gladiator arena set. It'll be the Ultimate Pit Fight set. This makes sense to me. It also is like kind of what Ultimate Pit Fight needs right now Mm. for two different reasons. Like, first of all, when draft is one on one, all draft is one on one. And like it feeds right into like Blitz, right? Like, you just made a draft deck with 30 cards and a young hero. You just add 10 more cards and you can like play like Blitz with your friends. Or like you had a really good time in Blitz and um, you had a really good time in a draft. So, you want to turn that hero that you just had a really good time with into a blitz deck. That's the closest corollary, right? And then after you have some fun there, you can turn that blitz deck into a CC deck. I'm enjoying this character in blitz. I might as well try them in CC. And there's a pathway there where ultimate pit fight is completely separate. Mm. Like you can't ride that train to ultimate pit fight. You have to get off and walk. (laughs) (laughs) But now, Ultimate Pit Fight has a natural progression where you can just play a draft, have your first experience with a hero be this draft format, and your first game with that hero is Ultimate Pit Fight. And then when you win that game, you're like, oh, am I the world's best (laughs) new Yokosai player? (laughs) I have to pick up this hero and then try them in Ultimate Pit Fight. You know, If these heroes are somewhat designed for multiplayer and the cards in this set feel like they're designed for multiplayer, then when you have the experience in draft, it makes you want to play Ultimate Pit Fight. Like an advertisement, right? Like mm-hmm. a free sample. This is what Ultimate Pit Fight kind of feels like. Now that you've got a taste, why not try the real thing, you know? This is the first time we've seen that in the game. I think it also opens up Ultimate Pit Fight cubes. Oh, yeah. Mm. Exactly. And another th- big thing about like cubes is the card pool, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of like the second reason that I think this is really good Ooh. for UPF. And that's like the actual card pool getting printed support for multiplayer. Ooh, that sounds like a prediction. Well, we actually have already seen it. Oh. Like all of those, <laughs> every equipment in the set right now is something that it doesn't make any co- sense. We have a complete set of equipment, head, chest, legs, arms, offhand, that scales based on the amount of opponents that you have. And how much life they have, which is not something that would have made any sense to print in a set that doesn't have Ultimate Pit Fight Draft. And it would be weird to print the entire set in a supplementary product that's not, like, draftable. Unless you just had a hero that just, like, has them all. But the fact that they're generic makes sense in a draft. Like, Mm -hmm. this is the context that they're going to print stuff like that in. And stuff like that, like, the cheap staples for generic heroes in multiplayer, like, it's, now that we're seeing it, 
it gets a lot easier to make an ultimate pit fight deck because you have like collections of cards that can carry over between kind of like null rune and iron rot yeah for cheap like constructed decks Mm -hmm. so the fact that we're seeing a multiplayer set is going to lead to multiplayer card pool opening up and that's one of those things that you would need for a cube so overall i am very happy for ultimate pit fight (laughs) It's a format I've never really played, but I can't. I'll probably end up playing more of it. Right? It's like kind of inevitable. I have to play multiplayer games anyway. But like, here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this this monologue is so great. Because you never monologue like this. I love it. <laughs> well, I knew that. Is I kind of expected a monologue when we were doing the notes, and I was like, we should talk about this. And you guys kind of just shrugged. And I was like, oh, well, I actually okay. I have some thoughts. I'm just waiting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But here's the other thing. Before I like, I give up the mic. Okay. People don't actually like Ultimate Pit Fight. It's not just that this is an unsupported format. It's that multiplayer games are fundamentally different. They're a different dynamic. I can't just skill my way into a win in a four-player game. Because if I'm like... Like, let's say you're Alex Ar- Argirio. And you sit down to play an Ultimate Pit Fight draft... The other three guys at the table are gunning for you. (laughs) You can't just be good at flesh and blood to win a multiplayer. You also have to have social skills. I can't be expected (laughs) to be good at two things. You can be expected. We can't expect it of other flesh and blood players. Not everybody can be a charming podcast host. True. (laughs) No, not everybody can. So yeah, we are going to win all of our ultimate (laughs) (laughs) It just it's a different dynamic, right? And I can see it being like way more casual and I like to bring sweaty energy <laughs> into drafts, you know? And that sweaty energy doesn't work out, but I'll be really salty if it doesn't work out because the two guys on my left and right just decided that I get to die first, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't think that it can be for any real competitive event. Like I don't think they can be doing this for callings. Because at the end of the day, if you just get three friends in a pool, you can say who's going to first. Like yeah. you can, we used to roll up to armories with like eight people. Mm-hmm. What happens if we all get in a pool? We kill our friends, <laughs> or we lose to the ones we have crushes. Or on. what if? <laughs> hey, <laughs> yo. hey yo. <laughs> Or like, say, what if six of us get into a draft pool? Yeah, yeah. Right, like, there's just too much scumbag behavior that could happen mm-hmm. that I don't think that this can be the official. Maybe it's what they in, do for pre-release. In a word, maybe it's what they do for some certain fun social events. I know they have that new social armory kit with Melody on it. Mm -hmm. Maybe they do the same thing here, but this can't be for anything really competitive. I think a good word for what you're looking for is gamesmanship. Like, how much agency do we as the players have over how structurally the event goes, you know? And there's a little bit more gamesmanship here, right? Like, the odd man out who doesn't happen to be our friend in this four-man UPF fight, like, taking him out first is kind of scummy, and kind of makes a lot of sense from a gamesmanship perspective. So I get what you're mm-hmm. saying. So I, I will say I agree and disagree with both of you. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the fact that UPF is kind of like being forced upon the flesh and blood populace, <laughs> mm-hmm. but it is a little bit early, right? Like Magic had an extensive career before Commander became a thing and kind mm-hmm. of took over, right? And Clark, I agree and disagree with you as well because you say, you know, uh, well, I, I think a little bit higher of flesh and blood players, like on a, on a lower level, like Armory, like I yeah, think. Yeah, we're I, not magic. We're not <laughs> Yu Gi Oh players. Right. So I, I think more people often than not would like play the, the game to its fullest. But I also agree that it can't really be like played at a competitive level because Commander arguably is all consuming of Magic the Gathering, still <laughs> doesn't have sanctioned competitive events for the very same reason because there's like the threat of collusion there's a threat of like games taking forever like the four horsemen shit it's just i mean a lot of card shops do <clears throat> run cedh competitive tournaments where like they will put up like 50 dollar or like a hundred dollar mm-hmm. card prize no for, for the sure winner. and and i've played in some of them <clears throat> but those aren't sanctioned by wizards of the coast is what i'm saying yes Another thing about, like, this set is it's a main set, you know? Right. Like, with Magic the Gathering, the corollary is Conspiracy, which was not actually a, like, mainline standard product. Mm -hmm. It was a set that they made just for multiplayer draft. That was the purpose. It's like, we want to make multiplayer draft. So they made Conspiracy. And it had other cool aspects, too, like, things that, like, you drafted and you announced them and, like, wrote notes down that was kind of cool. But 
it's a little different than heavy hitters, which is like, this is the main set of the format. This is going to be what everyone, this, this is what flesh and blood means for the next three months. And everyone's going to be on board and y'all have to play ultimate pit. Fight, you know, <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. I'm going to make a prediction. They <laughs> are going to print cards for limited specifically for UPF. Like they're going to let you maybe attack that diagonal player or they're going to, you wouldn't count the armor. Yeah. That, that's already the kind armor of, is definitely one of them. I think they're going to print a lot more. Well, yeah, mm, I don't know if that's a prediction. That's like the same grounds, like the right. dominate thing. All right, sure. Respectfully. All right, okay, okay, Joel. Okay, okay, Joel. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will say if they do end up having specific, like very, very specifically skewed UPF, I'll give it to you. Okay. With that tension between a competitive draft experience and a casual UPF free for all, where you don't actually have a lot of control, right? They've introduced actually what I think is a really hype event, and that's this deathmatch arena. So when they announced the set, they said, okay, every time there's a limited event, we are going to be watching. <laughs> We're going to be keeping track. And whatever limited hero wins the most official sanctioned limited events, not just armory drafts, but like battle, not battle hardens, uh, road to nationals, pro quests, like those sorts of level events. We're going to have a running tally, and whoever, whichever hero wins the most, we're going to keep track of who won with that hero, and we're going to mail promos to your house. <laughs> Sheesh! LSS is going to have my address? I don't know about that. Well, I said, anybody who gave their address willingly to Legendary <laughs> Studios will have one shipped to their house. Yeah, what happens if I live off the grid? <laughs> I mean, they're, they're going to send me my acceptance letter for, uh, to be hired anyway, so I might as well give them that information now. <laughs> you're right, you're right, you're right. So... I'm going to make a bold prediction. I'm going to call the winner of this deathmatch arena. Yo, <laughs> we only know one of the heroes. <laughs> Are you going to say it's going to just be Kasai? You're just like, Kasai's not going to win. So I think it will be the guardian hero that does not represent a returning character. Oh, okay. <laughs> Out of the two guardians, we think one of them will be a returning character. The other one won't. I think it'll be the one that isn't. <laughs> that's my prediction. You think that's, it's going to be the brand new Guardian. The new Guardian. That's going to be the craziest tiebreaker of, of this episode. <laughs> that's new going to Guardian be insane. <laughs> We're not even going... When we do our, like, hey, how did our predictions turn out? We're going to be like, this hasn't happened yet. <laughs> <laughs> do we give this point to Fuzzy? Yeah. Wait, that makes a difference? Shit! <laughs> <laughs> that's I, so funny. Also, just to read the announcement, mm -hmm. they say the hero will have their triumph immortalized on a special prize card that will be shipped to each player who won an event that contributed points. Special prize card could kind of mean anything. At first, I was kind of assuming it's like a promo version of that hero, like extended art cold foil or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be like the hero card. Um, Joel brought up that he was like, wait, is it going to be something like exclusive to this event? And I'm like, I can't imagine that happening, but it could be like anything. Maybe their uh, weapon. Right, every mm. hero has an associated weapon that will leave once they living legend out. So maybe it's a cold or gold foil version of that weapon. So here's another prediction. I think it's going to be a crown. I think they're mm. going to print some sort. Oh, that's a or great a trophy. prediction. I think they're going to print a card, perhaps even in the main set that represents a trophy for the winner, and they're going to print like a foil version of that trophy, maybe with an alternate art or something. Of that or, hero holding it. Oh, well, yeah, that hero holding it. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I was going to say. <laughs> Wait, does that mean that's my prediction? <laughs> <laughs> you interrupting does not give you predictions. So Come on. <laughs> there's going to be like a trophy or a crown card, and a promo version of it will go to the Deathmatch Arena. So since you guys both did it, I guess I'll end my section by naming, just like throwing out a couple extra predictions. Sure. Um, as far as reprints go, I think, God, you would think I would like thought this, I was thinking Spinal Crash, but now I'm not thinking Spinal Crash. I think it wouldn't be a Majestic. That would be a sweet reprint. That would be a sweet reprint. Cause I think it's pushing like $10 something like also that. Also negates agility tokens. Yeah. Can't gain go again. Yeah. But would still proc the agility token when you play the card. It's kind of hot. I think we might God, see some other older reprints from like Welcome to Wrath. Like, mm. Welcome to Wraith had all three of these heroes, like, in them, you know? Yeah. So, but I think, like, Snatch. I'm going to say Snatch. Really? I think, like, 
maybe with some alternate art, Snatch could like really easily be flavored into like a gladiator arena. Wait, wasn't Snatch in Outsiders too? Or my no? Okay, I don't think that really had any. No, reprints. that didn't have Snatch. Okay, never mind. Because okay, you guys, print. you guys want me to make bold predictions? I don't even really believe that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe it either. Snatch so I'm reprint. happy that's one of fuzzies. I'm also going to predict no reprints. Wow. <laughs> Well, you're already wrong because they reprinted Centauri Sabers. <laughs> <laughs> no reprints other than weapons. Boo. <laughs> so I feel like I'm a little uh, inadequate here. <laughs> like, I think you coming to the predictions episode, I don't feel like I have anything really spicy to say, but I'm really excited about this set. Uh, do you guys want to move on to our Arsenal Zone? Sure. Sure. So, listeners, our Arsenal Zone is normally where we each shout out a card that we've been thinking about lately, but we're going to reflavor it a little bit today, and instead we're each going to predict a card that we might see in the expansion slot of Heavy Hitters. We already know a couple cards at time of recording, including some Assassin stuff, um, Coercive Tendency, an Arachne Specialization, Graven Call, and... Um, we saw the Azalea specialization, Judge Jury Executioner, and there's also like a card clearly meant for Riptide like in there. So lots of outsiders support. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. guess they didn't feel like those heroes were cool enough the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would also say that um, in terms of what we already know, Viscerai, a Viscerai, a rune, sorry, a specifically a rune blade card has already been spoiled. We don't know what the text or the name of it is yet. But we know that there's going to be a Rune Blade card. We also know there's going to be like a Prism card. Yes. So we know that there's already a couple of certain heroes and classes already getting support. So we're not going to include that. Like if I say there's going to be a Rune Blade card, like that's not good enough. So this might be a little bit of a reach, but they just printed a hero with a pretty clear gap in his defensive capabilities. I'm talking about Teclovozin not having access to Arcane Barrier unless he really stretches for it. So I think that this is really something I'm going to keep saying until they actually do it, but <laughs> maybe this set we will see an Evo with Arcane Barrier or uh, Arcane Prevention, Arcane Damage Prevention in wow. some way. Okay. I don't think they're going to do that quite yet, especially because Kano and Icelander have both LL'd. Like, I mean, Kano's Blitz. still in CC, mm -hmm. but they're both gone from Blitz, and I don't think Kano has a big meta share in Blitz right now. Yeah, and they kind of seem to be comfortable having a hero that auto-loses to, like, one other hero. And it's not even an auto-lose, it's just you can't do the singularity play style. Well... No, that's an auto-loss. It's pretty close to auto-loss, because if your whole deck... I guess if you're running the boost plan, it's less auto losey. So maybe you're right. I, I think they're okay with it not quite being there. I, I hey, I like you making the prediction. <laughs> <laughs> Means I'm gonna. You're not gonna. Well, get what do you point. think they're gonna print in the expansion slots? For my prediction, mm -hmm. I say that they are going to print a shadow card. Fuck, <laughs> just a straight shadow card <laughs> because. Like slay. Like Slay, but Slay was specifically like very story oriented. Like so this Angels aren't be, yes. really an issue right now, mm -hmm. right? But I think they are going to print a shadow card because I think Leviah is still struggling even after getting a lot of support and letting the meta settle. Mm -hmm. And I think Vincent hasn't quite gotten the support that they want. They hasn't quite done the things that they want to see her doing. Mm-hmm. And so I think for both of those reasons, they want to print support for both of those heroes. And I think that the best way of doing that is, one, letting these brute cards help Leviah, but still printing a shadow special, like a shadow card that works for both of them. Something playable out of the banish zone, probably like a non-attack action card. Because right now, I don't really think, apart from the, uh, the like three-cost big pump card, there's any shadow non-attack action cards that... Vincent really feels comfortable running and playing out of the Banish Zone. So I think they are going to print a non-attack action card that is playable from the Banish Zone and is just going to be Shadow. Hmm. Maybe I put too many qualifiers there. Because <laughs> what if it's like a Shadow Instant? Do I still get the point? You might get two-thirds of that point, yeah. <laughs> Never mind, just a Shadow card, just Shadow. I'm not specifying non-attack, instant, I attack... <laughs> 
I can't just edit. backspace, Clark. Like I'm editing this one. <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> Damn it! You guys are just trying to take my crown. <laughs> you're just trying to you're just trying to keep me down, man. We're punching up. <laughs> <laughs> I well, didn't even make that many predictions. Do you, do you have any, Joel? Yeah. So um, I should have went first because Clark stole my fucking idea. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> no, I, my, mine's a little bit more specific. So I was also thinking of. A Levia cards, uh, specifically to get us away from scapskin leathers. So I'm thinking mm. of a legendary leg piece for Shadow Brute or Brute, I guess, but it's going to work more with Levia. That's because I think it'll have to do with like banishing like a card from hand and like maybe three from graveyard to give your next attack go again or something like that. Like mm -hmm. make it like a steep cost to give go again. Because currently, we have both beaten trackers for Reinar, which is the discarding you get an action mm -hmm. point if you destroy it. And then we have hooves as the equivalent for Levia. Yes, exactly. So if you, for with hooves of the Shadow Beast, if you banish a six from Graveyard, you can destroy it to get an action point. Oh. So we have Reinar with Scapskin Leather. That's clearly his equipment. I think we're still missing Levia's. So I think we're still missing Levia's Scapskin Leathers. I think it's going to be another way to get action points, but. Um, it's going to be like, you know, something to do with banishing either from hand or from graveyard or both. But I think it's going to be like a steeper cost. But with Levi's new play style playing out of banish and, um, you know, Shadow Bla or Blasm Fit, Levi consumed, making it easier to play out of banish. I think, yeah, I think there's going to be a, a new leg piece for Levi. All that to, all that to say. Yeah. No, I like that. And I already am starting to have some ideas. I think they may go like a carrying husk route because mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think they like how scabskins could be repeatable throughout the game. Right. So maybe it's like a three block temper that banishes itself with a blood debt and it creates an agility token. And I can see that being just shadow. Mm. I can see that being also something that they're maybe that's the shadow card that they also give to Vincent because Vincent likes having multiple go again. Or trying to get go again somewhere in, yeah. in their play style. Yeah, so I think I think um Levi is gonna get like a parallel scapskin leather. This is my total cool. mm -hmm. is my complete prediction. No, I think that's a great prediction. Yeah, I like it. They created the symmetry already with the with the common versions, and now yeah. they're gonna create symmetry with the legendaries. Yeah, because they they continue that same trend in um dusk told on um they kind of gave us like the bandage from hand yeah uh, kind of copying the same mm -hmm. um you know structure as as reinar so um yeah I, I think that's the next step and i think it'll like give levi a bit more support and may even let us use more of the cards in heavy hitters that are specific to whatever brutes get printed in heavy hitters you know sure i feel like it'd be really separate from what they're doing in heavy hitters because we're already getting the brute support there so they would want something to be very different and more tied to the Dust to Dawn play style. Um, maybe. I, I think yeah. it could go either way. Mm -hmm. okay. Especially if they introduce like a new mechanic for Bruce yeah. specifically, you know? And that is still different from my prediction because mine was a shadow card playable from the Banished Zone specifically. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Cool. Awesome work, guys. We feel good wrapping up there? Yeah. yeah. Thank you guys for listening and... We'll see you next week. Bye. Ciao. Pitch It To Me podcast is hosted by Fuzzy Dell, Clark Moore, and Joel Racinos. Our executive producer is Talon Stradley. Logistics coordinator, John Farkas. Music by Dylan Hulse. Logo by Han V and sound mixing by Christopher Moore. Last but not least, we'd like to thank you, the listener. Thank you for tuning in. Please give us a follow on your favorite social media platform at Pitch It To Me Podcast.